We Americans of today, together with our allies, are passing through a period of supreme test. It is a test of our courage, of our resolve, of our wisdom, of our essential democracy. If we meet that test successfully and honorably, we shall perform a service of historic importance, of historic importance which men and women and children will honor throughout all time. As I stand here today, having taken the solemn oath of office, in the presence of my fellow countrymen, in the presence of our God, I know that it is America's purpose that we shall not fail. World War II proved to be the largest war ever fought in human history. Over 60 million people were killed, which was about 3% of the 1940 world population, an estimated 2.3 billion. With over 400,000 U.S. forces dead, that meant 1 in 56 didn't make it back home. However, Sergeant Curtis R. Lamb would make it back after years within the front line as a medic with the 21st General Hospital. Men like Sergeant Lamb ensured that President Roosevelt's words of America's purpose of winning would not fail. I was a sergeant uh, in the medical business, the T sergeant. You were a technical sergeant? Yeah. What branch were you? 21st General Hospital followed all the invasion. Man, I was drug into it. I drafted. So I was the fall of the year, I know, but I can't remember just which, what month that was. A little place down there I called Oak Hill, Arkansas. Sedgwick, we'll put it. Oak Hill Community. No, they just took me, jerked me up there and sent me to England. <laughs> the old boy had been to Jonesboro twice in his life, farmer. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I was living down there on, raised around Sedgwick, and they picked me up, gave me a medical test, and first doctor I'd really been to, and I was ready to go, put me in a hotel and waited for the train to come through, and it, boy, I, I went from there to England. I took my basic training and went to England to trade with them British soldiers. And uh, me being a farmer and a coon hunter, I, I could keep up with them, but a lot of the boys couldn't keep up. Them boys was tough. And uh, one more thing, yeah, yeah. We went from there and we made the invasion we crossed the, that ocean before we had declared war. And I went across that ocean with all them, with a big ship, thousands of us. Now, they, we, then I, I never had been in 
just owned the boat or nothing, but it was, I, they told, told us that we would be, you know, come in with a convoy. Now, can you imagine all the submarines and all the, the planes they had back then before we never made the invasion? And went across there, we'd go, in, we'd go one way and go back this way. We never did find no convoy. We had one shot, one submarine down, or didn't shoot it down, but some of them said they thought afterwards it was a barrel. Anyway, we went uh, by the Rock of Gibraltar and right into North Africa and made the first invasion. Well, I didn't feel too bad because they they told us just like they brainwash people today about everything. They, they told us you boys will be lucky. You boys will be the war boys that will stop all wars. This is, the, this is the war that will end them. There won't be no more wars after this. When you just get through this time, it'll be all of it. We went into, uh, next we went and made the invasion of France. They shot the boys all over the There's bodies laying everywhere, you know, on that. They had them, they had them cannons and all that machinery put by, back under, under caves. And they opened them doors when we got close and just well, mowed, them, mowed them down by the thousands. Oh yeah, Virgil Fish, he was from Jonesboro there. We was always taking the trucks, going out and getting the troops and, uh, that were shot. And one night they had a little old plane come over and Virgil, he heard, he heard it and he come out there and it was a it shot, it was just mowing them down. <laughs> Directly, uh, bang! And another one hit there, and it busted my door to open. And that time, the the boat, the, the he come running down through there, through there, and there was a big tree set down out there, and I had squirrel hunted enough to watch them squirrels. You turn to one side, and I run for that tree and stayed on stayed on that tree. And uh, when he'd come around, baby, 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 it was a place where they wasn't supposed. The Red Cross was had it crossed off for their patients. We'd bring the patients in there, and they was protected. And this one old German come in there, and I, I, I run into an old boy there, and, I, and he just stuck my nose, you know, and whatever went out for it. And I was wanting out, he was, I got behind that tree, and that, 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 or the mayor said, come in tomorrow, I'll carry the patients out, and I'll give you a, a red cross for, for your acre. And I said, man, them, them old kill roughnecks, they wouldn't, they'd laugh me out of, out of the church. Out of the, so uh, he said, I don't believe I've seen that in the manual, though, but he said it worked, didn't it? Well, been out there farming and working in the timber and doing everything. I could, I could go that 25 mile without a bat and an eye, you know, to carry that back because I'd hauling hay and all that stuff. And, and then Mother Nature gave me a lot of it, how the people of the wild protect themselves. It was more on an instinct on a lot of it. It's like one of two or three boys was playing with a, with a bomb they'd, a, a they'd picked up there. And we was going, I didn't get no time off, to, I didn't get no time off to speak of, but 
We, they picked up the, I won't call her names because uh, on account of the folks, but they was pitching one over here. I'd had a list a little too much of vino. And they said, well, wait till Kurt, wait till Lamb gets here. He says, uh, uh, he's, he's always hunting for some place to hide when them Germans go shelled it over. And he, he come in and hit the gate. At that time, I got just all a hundred yards or so, and he said, hey, Lamb. And that guy pitched the shell and it hit on his head, and we picked him up by his little fingers and by his knees, just his feet and everything. And uh, so we buried him under a rock. I went, got Major Fish and got his uh, uh, dog tags and gave it to him. I could go over there to Italy right now and put, dig him up. Just little old things like that, just to watch. I hollered at him and come back. I had never confessed religion through all that because uh, before you're truly saved and walk the line, you don't have no conscience. They'll tell you, oh, you're miserable as you can be, but you just have a joy of a time. You just come to a cross and the road you take it. You know, it's just a fork in the road or anyway. But I, I, people, and a lot of the preachers, it's real good. And I give the preachers lots of credit, and the church and the church members, I give them a lot of credit. I pray that they'll stay free, that all you boys can confess, because it's pretty simple. He promises, he gave us a lot of promises. He said to them, first, come knock on his door, he'd never turn you away. Second, he said, backed up by his father, the God said, I'll never forsake you. Well, that's, if you study them two points, <coughs> you'll find they're pretty deep. Went well, down, to, I went first, first to Texas, Georgia to take my basic training, then I went over to, 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 to uh, and took the rest of it, and then they bombed Pearl Harbor, and then uh, after that I went to England, but there's enough of them boats there in Oran, Africa, to, uh, we would cross on planks from one boat to another, and then from then on, it was just pure war. Well, you went to Italy? Huh? You went to Italy? Yeah, I went to all of them. I, I was right in the middle and behind on Italy, France. We plumbed on up into Germany, waited there in Germany for the Russians to drive them. We made a line there where that brick wall was. We made a line. And they made a line, and we waited there till uh, the Germans I come as coming in at the back door. They'd come around and and, <laughs> and, and be captured. You know, they'd, you'd find them lying on the road a hundred times to be captured. We built. They built a fence, and I, I took twenty-five of, them and I would walk from uh, all say quarter of a mile from where, where, the, where my place was in the hospital. And they, they're more as just as good as they could be. They, they'd, but they know that I done the, with a, a, a favor. They said that when I found a German, and he is just kind of wounded, I took him in too, just like I did our boys there, you know. If he was, he's human and I just, We'd, we'd carry him in. They had a, little, had a place for him, and they had a place to, and they, I'd get up four o'clock in the morning and take them boys to, up to the camp, up to our kitchen. They was workers, they'd work there. 
Uh, they, they had uh, wash all them pads and all that stuff, you know, help cook, do everything. It was amusing, but it was, I can't say I had fun. Big hospital, and it had the, all the medicine and had everything for them boys that, that was hurt, you know, and crippled up. And we had to dig them out of the water or whatever things that was, I was behind it. And we'd pick them up. They had a hospital already stationed for us, so pretty close to take care of them. Well, what stood out to me most, I think, was watching them, them Germans, they had them pictured as just booger bads, and just mean and all. What, what really stood out is they were so good of, of uh, when it comes to their work and their feelings and how they would hunt for us on the last to be captured. I, I trained them just as good as I could. In fact, they had a heart. When I, I, I did that longer than most anybody, I went in it for the war, for the declared. And them boys, when I left there after, and I'd go with that quarter of a mile, with this fence, I'd go there without a gun, without anything in the morning, every morning, every night. When I left the accident, some of them shed tears when one doesn't took my place. They had a big heart. I don't say they're great. I, I, what I blame is the leaders. Come that close. Glad you brought that up. That's the main thing. I, I have a little temporarily mental spot once in a while goes through my old 99 year old head. They was a terrible, terrible snowstorm. And it just stopped us on the tracks which was, as we was gradually moving and, uh, and right up close to Germany. And this, this snow was so deep that you, uh, it was over the heck of wood. Well, these Germans, they got them a bunch of white robes, and here they start, started. It was uh, on them skis, some kind of uh, something that just go in there. And that, they, all the officers and nurses in my outfit right there in that particular place. There was a bunch of them. They all left, you know, left us there just to take, do or die, us and all the patients. And them Germans, when they, when they got organized, all they waited, these Air Force waited till they got just right. And when they got just right, you couldn't, you could see thousands of them uh, American boys in planes coming in. I don't believe a mouse could have lived in, on a line for about four or five miles just, just to mow them and they had killed them Germans by the hundreds. You talk about a poor, starved to death, hundreds of food. It, that was sad. I come close. And I had a, a, a neighbor, a, a boy there from Oak Hill. He wouldn't care if they called his name, Joe Doyle, Joe Harvey Doyle. He, and he said that it was the most pitiful looking thing he ever seen. He was, he went and had washed it and seen them. They were just skin and bone. They'd starved them to death, killed them, put them in that big, a gas house and blowed gas and I uh, killed them all. I never, I never done nothing spectacular. 
I never doubted enough to get it in. I, the job I had there was to mostly help people instead of killing. But I did get a chance to, that I wanted to kill a time or two, but I never did do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. About how often did you write letters home? Oh, I don't know, just, yeah, that after four years, you you get, you fade away. I, I'd say at least once a month and maybe more. They crossed out a lot that I wrote because I was a little bit too, I'm free of speech. I believe in everybody telling the truth about that thing. Oh, there might have been a little shortage in spots there where it was a heavy battle, but but you always had your abomination. I seen that you had that and food. Well, did you feel any kind of pressure or any stress? Well, there was plenty, plenty of it if you'd let it be, but you got to learn to switch your mind and and. If it's something you can't help, what are you going to do? Oh, I don't believe in nothing suspicious or superstitious or none of that <laughs> stuff. All right, you brought up a subject there that I, there's thousands of them, but I'm talking too much anyway, but I, I sat here to listen. Good to let off a little steam. It's the first time I've done that. First time I've had a you know. We've got a little, little deal, a little vacation, a week off out of that four years. We went out to the ocean. They had a little cabin for us. There's 25 of us. And this old boy, he said, there's a boat down there. You could see it. It's about nearly a mile, it looks like. He was. He says, "I'm gonna go out there." He was a professional swimmer. You know, he could he could st swim all I guess all night. He 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 said, "I said, Joe, I said you you ain't going to do that be that foolish. Or that's another thing. It's kind of keep planning just a little ahead of what you're gonna do." He said, yeah, I said, they may be something that I want. And he went over there, and he, he got there. He waved his old hat and waved, you know. He stayed just about an hour, and I just sat there on the bank and watched him. Me and another old boy, he jumped in, and here he come. He got all about halfway, maybe a little further. And I said, I don't believe he's moving. And this other guy said, well, he said, how, how can you keep from it? He said, he, he said, he's out there, he's on the water. I said, you check that there, he ain't getting get any closer. About an hour, he still wasn't closer. About another hour, he still, I said, that. so I went for help, and while I was gone uh, for, for help, he but on, he went down. And this old boy, he sat there with me. He jumped in that water when I had my officers when we come back. He jumped in that water and come back out sneezing and, and he, he said, I, I'm going to put in for, for saving a man's life right here and getting all ready. And he, he put that in. I don't know if he got it or not. But that's that's a memorable thing. Huh? I liked them. They was they was, they was pretty good people. They they wasn't no they wasn't no fussed over race or fussed over what we was doing. We just went in there to do a job and we done it. This needs to be done. What what we could, all we could do, for the cause. 
And I shouldn't gripe. I, I, I shouldn't ever gripe about it because I had a, I've had about 75, 80 full good free years out of the deal. So I, I, I ain't bitter. People don't know what happy is. I mean, it's beyond expression. It ain't nothing, there ain't nothing can describe it just like it is. When you know, I, I have still had suspicion. I said, now you watch this. I want my boat as I go by. There's something happened to it. There'll be something. I always watch it ahead for danger because I'd seen a, a boat uh, at one of the trips, they bombed one that's just ahead of the other, sir. And them boys was laying, the boat parted them. They just went all, all both ways. And, and, and uh, every one of them was on their face. I couldn't see if every one of them laying on their back come floating by like dead fish. And I said, boy, you talk about being happy and enjoying it, you do. When you come home, you don't. You can't imagine how much. Uh, in four years, well, I got me a little old seventy-four Ford, or Ford, uh, no, seventy-four, twenty-four, and I took them roads to see what was going. I took that country in. When I come to a fork in the road, I took it. But I went to that GI school when I come back at Ponder Switch, I could call it then. Oh, yeah, you don't understand it till you're there. It's one of them things you got to do, not see. It's <laughs> Hello and thank you for watching Arkansas Valor presented by T-Word Media. If you or someone you know is the relative of a veteran or a veteran themselves that would like to speak to us about their service to our nation or their service abroad, we would like for you to contact us at the information below. Contact at twardmedia.com. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us at Twitter for the up-to-minute information on projects that we're working on including Arkansas Valor and those who will be featured on our next interview. We are so proud to talk to our nation's veterans, to speak to them about their service, to speak to them about their sacrifices during wartime and during peacetime. We can never repay the debt that our veterans have given this nation, from those who have sacrificed their lives to those who have sacrificed pieces of themselves. We are eternally grateful and blessed to call you our nation's veterans. On behalf of all of us at T-Word Media, God bless you, and thank you for watching Arkansas Valor.